like to uh, speak this evening <coughs> um, about a uh, little thing called life and death, which is a matter of life and death importance for most of us. Uh, and uh, <coughs> One of the reasons why uh, the topic came up was because a few people have been asking me recently about um, their pets and actually got an email this morning. This is what happens if you're a Buddhist monk. People, people write you these emails and say they've got their, their dog which is tremendously sick and ill and blah, blah, blah and all the family wants to put them down and, and should we put the dog down? All right. So I've got to try and answer these questions over my cup of coffee in the morning. And... Uh, <laughs> What can you say? Yeah. Keep the dog alive and keep it suffering. Put the dog down. Kill it, right? Putting it down, it means killing it. Yeah. <laughs> Putting it down is like a euphemism. <laughs> kill. Kill my beloved pet. Is that what you want to do before lunchtime? Just, what are you doing this morning, darling? Oh, just popping off to kill the dog. <laughs> Uh, it's not a laughing matter. I should be serious. Right. And it's very interesting how, how um, traumatic it can be. And uh, people, I've met several people who've agonized so much over the uh, death of their pet. And some people have even told me, you know, like when my mum died, it was nothing, you know. But when my dog died, you know, <laughs> I really couldn't handle it. And uh, so what to do? And I think it's important that we um, <coughs> uh, learn uh, how to think about these kinds of questions. Uh, sometimes we want answers to them. So sometimes we, we'd like to, you know, uh, be able to have a nice, clear, simple answer to our moral dilemmas. And uh, unfortunately, the world is not always constructed in that way. Uh, you know, it's not like a kind of mathematical table where you can sort of write a, a list of answers to all of your questions and just sort of look it up when you get the right question. The world is too complex. Uh, so what's not... What's... Um, what's important... Uh, is to be clear about uh, what kind of decision that we're making and how we're coming to that decision. What are the reasons for making that decision? And what is our motivation? What's lying behind that decision? And uh, <coughs> there's been some interesting uh, research into uh, moral decision making. Uh, especially a fellow called, a psychologist called Kohlberg was quite well known for that. Uh, he basically identified, so obviously it gets much more complex than this, but very simply identified three stages uh, and or three levels of, of moral reasoning. One is what he called pre-conventional, which basically means um, I'll do it if I can get away with it. Right? So you're going to, anything which is, you, you'll try to, you, 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 you won't do something if you think you're going to get punished for it. Okay? And then there's a conventional uh, set of reasoning which is basically based on an idea of a social contract. Yeah? So, that, so if we, we, we should all keep the law, we should keep the rules. Or, you, for example, you think in a religious context, you'd say killing is wrong because it says so in the, in the suttas. Okay? Or it says so in the Ten Commandments or whatever it is. Therefore, it's wrong. It's like a conventional approach. And then a post-conventional approach which is based on uh, a contextual understanding and an ability to reflect in terms of um, universal uh, moral values, like, say, the golden rule, yeah? do unto others as you would have others do unto you, uh, or, say, the a universal value of compassion, for example. Someone's able to reflect about the, the, the implications of a particular decision uh, based on these universal criteria. So this is like three different stages in moral 
development. And the interesting thing which the psychologists have identified <coughs> is that, generally speaking, these things form a progression uh, and that you don't go backwards. Yeah? So somebody who's, who's developed to one's, one's kind of level of thinking about moral questions doesn't tend to fall backwards to the earlier ones. And so it seems that there's a genuine sense in which these things form like a progression, uh, a deepening of maturity in our uh, ethical uh, consciousness. So when, we, when it comes to uh, a, a dilemma, should we kill poor Fido or not, then You know, we, 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 for, so as, as Buddhists, if we come from a Buddhist point of view, of course we have a Buddhist convention, right? And so the Buddhist convention says, I'll refrain from killing. Yeah, this is the first precept, first of the five precepts, first of any of the list of precepts in Buddhism, don't kill. And uh, as conventions go, that's a pretty good one, yeah? In fact, that's pretty essential. And it's very much the foundation of uh, any kind of moral um, uh, society must be some kind of limitation on killing, even if it's not an absolute limitation on killing. At the very least, you say, well, we're not going to kill our family and our tribe. Yeah? Or, and, and then sort of this kind of extension of this idea of not killing is one of the sort of developments that we have as a civilization. So this is a very important convention and not one to be transgressed or fiddled with lightly. Yeah? It's not something that we want to go around um, just playing with. And we recognize that as soon as you start to um, uh, mess with it, then it can open up some very, very uh, problematic cans of worms. So for, from a Buddhist point of view, that uh, precept or that, that convention of not killing is based on uh, uh, a perception or an understanding of uh, suffering and an understanding of the, uh, the fact that just as I suffer and I feel pain, so too do these beings suffer and they feel pain. Yeah? And there's actually one very nice little sutta when the Buddha was walking in for arms round and he saw some children playing with a crab and uh, sort of t tormenting this crab and uh, tearing its legs off and things like that. And, then, and he just sort of stopped and said, you know, kids, he said, you know, do you like feeling pain? They said, no. Would you like it if someone tore your legs and arms off? No. Well, do you think this crab likes it if you're tearing its legs and arms off? I said, oh, probably not. And so do you think it's a good thing to do? Mm, probably not. Yeah. And so this is the kind of, it's very interesting. It's just about, I think it's probably the only just about one of the very few discourses where the Buddha is actually teaching to children and he uses that uh, kind of moral reasoning with them and kind of leading them step by step to an understanding of that very, very fundamental precept, fundamental principle. So we have this convention not to kill, but we also recognize that that convention has fuzzy boundaries and no matter how important it is, it's very difficult to lay it down black and, in a black and white case. Okay? So the, one of the most obvious uh, bones of contention there is, does it include animals or not? Right? So of course, from a Buddhist point of view, we don't want to kill any sentient beings. Right? Most ethical systems tend to say, well, it's only, kill, only humans who count. Right? I mean, like you've got the Ten Commandments. It says, thou shalt not kill. Actually, it just says, don't kill. Right? <laughs> but uh, usually interpreted to mean don't kill people. And then there's probably a list of exceptions there as well. Right? Um, <clears throat> once you get into the fine print, you know, this is the kind of the legalese. It sounds very good. The first thing sounds great. And then there's the fine print with all the exceptions underneath. Uh, so this is obviously an extremely important point. Yeah? Is it uh, how far does our sphere of moral concern spread. Yeah? This is a very, very important point. And uh, you know, we can understand that that, in a sense, that um, relates to our uh, understanding 
of other beings <coughs> and how we, how we can connect with them. If it's other human beings, then of course we can connect and identify with each other fairly easily. It's, it's, it's very easy for us to recognize that other humans feel pain. Uh, they can tell us that they feel pain and so on. And uh, you have to get pretty extreme down the skeptical end of the philosophical spectrum to actually start doubting whether other humans feel pain or not. On the other hand, with animals, uh, there does seem to be quite a bit of uh, denial as to whether they feel pain or not. And it's, it's a question which uh, has been subject to, to, to scientific research and so on to see whether it's actually true. I mean, it seems intuitively obvious that animals feel pain, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, it does, there are these questions. And uh, I remember, for example, I used to work for or with Volunteer for Animal Liberation and we were down, uh, we used to have these, I don't know why they gave them to us, but the, the WA government for some reason gave us these uh, like inspectors passes. So two of us from Animal Lib had these passes and we could go anywhere into any place that was keeping animals for commercial purposes. And so we used to make all these kind of spot visits to factory farms and abattoirs and uh, sheep yards and all of these kinds of things and try to, try to annoy the people there as much as we could by asking them lots of questions. And uh, <coughs> I remember once we were at the, sh the sheep yards. And of course, if you know, in, in WA, one of the most controversial animal welfare issues has been the live sheep export. Yeah? And it's very, very, uh, uh, very controversial. They, basically, they export these sheep to the Middle East so they can be slaughtered in halal uh, style for the Muslims, even though, of course, it's perfectly possible to have them slaughtered halal in Perth. No reason why that can't happen. But anyway, that's what they do. And, you know, the conditions on the, the sheep ships and so on are, are dreadful. And there's always, many of the sheep will always die on the journey. And there's, there's all these kinds of uh, problems. It's quite horrendous, actually. And we were talking to some of the workers there about this, and they were insistent that, you know, no, the sheep don't suffer, no, there's not, no. If I thought that the sheep were suffering, I wouldn't do this. Yeah, that's what they insisted. If I thought they suffered, I wouldn't be doing this job. <laughs> yeah, so there is that level at which there's a, a, a denial of that. Uh, and even one of our members, as it happened, I can't remember the exact details of this, but one of our members ended up at a dinner with, now I can't remember who it was, was it John Elliott or someone, one of these big businessmen who was actually one of the main people who was doing the live, who was like the, you know, profiting from it, the live sheep export. And he said the same thing. He said, if you can prove to me that the sheep suffer, then I'll stop. I'll stop doing it. So, of course, this is the problem is, is the basic problem is the, the internality of consciousness, isn't it? How do you prove what somebody else is feeling? Yeah? How do you prove that an animal is suffering? And so the scientists will uh, do it through studying behavior. They'll say they show behaviors that indicate their suffering. They'll, they'll, they'll look at the kind of production of endorphins and different kinds of chemical things like that uh, to prove what really should be obvious. Uh, that they do in fact suffer, but none of those things can actually prove anything. I mean, if if you know if the body produces endorphins or whatever, that just proves that there's endorphins there. Yeah, you still have to infer from that that they're produced because of suffering. So <clears throat> it's very difficult to really prove these things uh, in a very absolute way. Nevertheless, it does seem to be fairly obvious. So this is that principle in Buddhism that uh, because Buddhism is based on the principle of uh, ending suffering yeah, so, so the Four Noble Truths and so the reason it's wrong to kill and the wrong to harm is because beings feel pain this is really the essence of it beings feel pain it's wrong to harm them because they feel pain yeah it's wrong to kill because beings are attached to their lives. They love their life. Yeah? And being separated from that is very painful. It's a very fearful thing. There's both the, the, the physical pain that's associated with uh, the death in most cases. Yeah? 
not always, but usually death is associated with a lot of physical pain, but also there's the, the deeper existential pain and existential fear that comes from losing that life to which we're attached to so deeply. So from a Buddhist point of view, uh, we respect all life. And in the Vinaya, that's the code of discipline for the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, uh, it talks about, it tries to define that. Of course, it's very difficult. Well, how far, you know, what kinds of, how far down do you take it? You know, are worms, yeah, mosquitoes, viruses, yeah. A virus is pretty minimal, yeah, but uh, is that still we have to respect that? So, in the the venue, it takes a practical thing. Basically, if there's any animal which is big enough to see, yeah, so even like a bed bug or something like a flea or something like that, as long as it's visible, then you shouldn't kill it. Okay, so that's a pretty demanding kind of um, standard. Yeah, so uh, we take we take that quite seriously. And uh, so we won't be won't kill ants and mosquitoes and all of these kinds of things. Nevertheless, that doesn't suggest, or is not meant to suggest, that killing animals is 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 morally equivalent to killing a human being. Okay, we merely it merely says that there is a degree of moral concern that we should have for the lives of animals. It doesn't say that that degree of concern should be the same as for the life of humans. So, of course, from a, from a Buddhist point of view, that human life is always more precious than animal life. But animal life, nevertheless, is still precious and is still worth uh, respecting. And that difference, again, is not arbitrary, but comes back to the, the basic uh, question, which is consciousness yeah, and awareness of pain. Yeah? Now, you and I know that, for example, that, that during the day, right, any day, we will experience different levels of consciousness, right? So right now you're sitting listening to a Dhamma talk. We've been doing some meditation. And so unless you're very tired from work or something, I would hope that you're feeling relatively conscious right now, okay? <laughs> That's not always the case in Dhamma talks, but I, I would, it's, it's, it's certainly hopeful, yeah? Uh, and if we've done some we're meditation, we're nice and clear and so on, and we can do it, yeah? And then... Maybe later this evening, we'll we will feel feeling more time. We'll go to sleep, yeah. And so we're maybe lying in bed, you know, just drifting off into sleep. Of course, we'll be barely conscious, yeah. We're much less able to be aware of things, yeah. And then even when we're asleep in deep sleep, then even less conscious still. So this is degree in which we're able to experience things, and we can all feel that. And it's so from a Buddhist point of view, we'd say that. Animals, the, the level of consciousness of animals, generally speaking, is not as highly developed as that of humans. Okay, uh, and and so for th that's the reason why uh, killing animals is generally not as morally serious as killing humans. Okay, now that's not an absolute; that's a generalization. It's just a rough kind of guess. Okay, so. Uh, Now, even when it comes to killing humans, then generally speaking in society, we admit of certain exceptions to that. Right? So, so general society says it's wrong to kill, it's murder to kill humans, and it's a very serious crime, you get to go into jail for it. Or, curiously enough, they kill you for it. Yeah? <laughs> so, they, so they execute you for committing murder. Yeah? Which is a kind of interesting piece of things you get your head around. I would guess, just thinking about that now, it seems to me that that would come from, I mentioned before, like the stages of moral reasoning, like pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional. Post if you're thinking on a post-conventional way, then that doesn't make any sense at all. If you're thinking on a conventional sense, then maybe it does make sense. Yeah. So the point of view of executing murderers is to preserve the, the structure of society yeah? and to, to as a deterrent. I mean, it's been proven by... Uh, countless studies that it doesn't act as a deterrent, okay, it just doesn't actually work. Uh, nevertheless, that would be the reason why, presumably, it's considered for the state 
can make and can execute, whereas individuals can't. Yeah? So the state can do that as a way of constructing uh, the boundaries of society. Individuals can't make that choice. Something like that would seem to be the, the logic that's going on there. Anyway, so uh, certain exceptions to killing. That's one of them, execution, right, in some places. Very lucky that Australia has managed to get rid of that, so that's good. Um, and I, I got in trouble a couple of years ago. You might find this difficult to believe, but, but actually a couple of years ago there was a uh, case in, in Singapore where a certain uh, a Viet, young Vietnamese guy from Melbourne was uh, executed for is carrying a small amount of drugs through Singapore or something like that. And uh, s somehow this email got circulated around from someone in Sydney, I don't know who it was from, uh, saying that basically there'd been a discussion about this among the Buddhist circles and someone said, that somehow my name came up and they said, oh, they, they were sure that Bande Sujato would have, would have approved the death penalty for, for drug trafficking. And so, I was in, I happened, as, it, as it happened, I was in Singapore at the time and uh, Kim sent me this email and said, can you write a response to this? I said, you're damn right I can. <laughs> so, so I wrote a response to it and I said that um, I don't believe in uh, the um, death penalty for anything and uh, certainly don't believe in it for drug trafficking. And... I'm not sure quite what I put in the email, but I, I think if you do get, if you are going to have uh, the death penalty for drug trafficking, then it should be based on the incidence of harm which is caused. Yeah? And by far, the greatest harm in trafficking drugs is caused by alcohol. So you should start by executing all the publicans. <laughs> uh, but if you're not going to be consistent about it, then uh, actually this is a bit of a, a sidetrack, but. Uh, uh, there was a study released in um, uh, England uh, just last week uh, and it was apparently the first ever study that was done on uh, an actual comprehensive study that was done on the costs of uh, making drugs illegal and they figured out that once you took everything into consideration, uh, all the private costs, government costs and uh, uh, social costs and everything, that in England they'd save about 14 billion pounds per year if they legalised all drugs in England. A kind of interesting piece of uh, um, piece of work there. But in any in any case, my personal feeling is that um, criminalising drug use is probably a waste of time. And uh, and so. Uh, anyway, so I sort of said this thing and I said that they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't um, do it. And anyway, I got in trouble. Some, some people thought that I shouldn't have been saying those things. But anyway, that's, uh, so there is this, this, society takes its on it, the state takes its on itself to uh, make the decision to execute in certain cases. That's one boundary line. Another boundary line, of course, is, is around the borders of life, right? So, say, uh, abortion, uh, euthanasia, stem cell research, all of these kinds of areas. So, so, so there's these kind of, kind of fuzzy areas where, where sometimes, um, you know, it's on those boundaries. It's in the twilight zones, yeah, between, like, you know, a fully adult, awake person and then um, maybe just a cell or clump of cells or something like that and then there's there's not a there's not a clearly defined point at which we can say that you know a human being has emerged here this is the problem and so this is always a problematic area in terms of defining uh, killing another uh, classic area of um, where there's a fuzziness in this is a time of war and uh, so generally speaking uh, you know, when a soldier kills in wartime, then this is not regarded as murder, all right? And but and that's that's these things always have boundaries on it. Like traditionally, that's that's managed by putting a soldier in a uniform, right? And so you have a recognised you know soldier. So it's okay for one soldier to kill another soldier in a wartime, right? But not to kill a civilian. Yeah, that's the that's the theoretically that's supposed to be the ethics of that situation. Yeah, 
of course, wartime is very fuzzy, and of course, this is why uh, the kind of the, the the thing of guerrilla warfare and terrorism and so on is always very challenging because it undermines that uh, uh, that distinction. So these are some areas where uh, we feel that um, society generally feels that uh, that um, stricture against killing can be violated or that there's a little bit of wiggle room at the very least. All right? Now, certainly I think that from a Buddhist point of view, we're certainly going to kind of move away from yeah, most of those things. I would hope so. Yeah? I, mean, I think from, as Buddhists we should oppose capital punishment. Yeah? And I don't think that's right. I think as Buddhists we should certainly... Uh, be horrified at the killing that goes on in wartime yeah? and, and, and be trying to do everything we can to minimize or eliminate the violence of war and so on in as many ways as possible. Uh, things like uh, euthanasia is more of a difficult one and I think there's more of a genuine moral dilemma there. I don't want to go into all the issues there right now but simply to recognize that there is a moral dilemma there. And uh, So in all of these cases, you know, we recognize that there's that, that, that fundamental principle uh, of the respect for life. Yeah? And yet, there's also all of these other circumstances which call that into question. Now, when it comes to considering animal life, basically the situation is, is, um, is, is, uh, uh, is not different in principle. It might be different in degree, but it's not different in principle. So there's still the basic assumption is that respect for life. Yeah? Now one of the things that's more difficult about the situation with animals is that it's harder for us to understand how they feel about these things. Right? So even if it's like Auntie Betty who's, who's lying on, the, on their, their deathbed right, and the doctor comes and says, shall we pull the plug? Right? There's no hope for Auntie Betty. Let's pull the plug. Let's, let's, uh, let's let her go. Or... If you're in a place where you know active euthanasia is legal, then you say, "Well, we'll give her some drugs and, and send her on her way." Yeah. Okay. So, if that happens, then in some way, you know, we you want to put yourself in Auntie Betty's shoes, right? And you have to be very clear about your motivation, right? Now, if you're thinking, Auntie Betty has got a big wad of cash stashed away under the sofa yeah, and uh, I can't wait to get my hands on it, right? Then this is not a very good motivation, yeah? Uh, so, but you try to understand. And, and the first question that you ask is, well, what would I want, right? If I was in that situation, would I want this to be prolonged or not, yeah? But, of course, that question doesn't necessarily... That's also a contextual one because Auntie Betty doesn't necessarily want what you want, Yeah? So this is the, one of the problems with, you know, of course, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And, uh, you know, this is this very fundamental uh, moral precept, a moral principle that underlies all of the great religious contexts and perhaps the best, one of the best teachings on that was given by, one of my favourite ones was given by um, Rabbi Hillel, a Jewish rabbi who was um, some, some generations before Jesus, and uh, <clears throat> some students came to him and said, uh, we want you to teach the whole of the Torah while standing on one leg. Right? So he got, gets up, stands on one leg and says, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That's the whole of the Torah. Everything else is commentary. Yeah? <laughs> Sounds pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. So that's the principle, but then how do you apply it? What, what, what really would that person want? And it's even harder if it's an animal. Yeah? Do, life is precious and life is beautiful. And a lot of people want to live. They have this will to live, even though it is painful. Right? You can say objectively, is there any quality of life? Well, maybe from your perspective, no, there's no quality of life, but they still cling to it. Yeah? Is actual quality of life, is that a relevant matter for many people? I remember when I saw my, my uh, grandmother 
uh, dying a few years ago, and she was like, 92, and uh, she'd had dementia for the last six months of her life, and um, was had, had a stroke, and uh, you know she's sort of lying on the deathbed, and you know, they invited me, they asked me to come over. She had my mother and the two, her two sisters, and. Um, so they were taking turns to sit by my their, their mother while she was dying, you know, and they all expected her to expire in a day or two. So they invited me to come over. So I came over, and we were sitting there, and it was it was quite extraordinary, you know. Just sort of she she just be there, and she just completely still. And then she she just breathe in. <sighs> And everyone would be sitting beside the bed. <laughs> Everyone's sort of sitting there twiddling their thumbs, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, poor grandma. And, just each breath was such such an effort, you know, such an effort. Just each one, and uh, day after day, you know, they were just sitting there. <sighs> <laughs> and then, and like life kind of reasserts itself, you know. And you're like, well, I'd, I'd love to sit here with my mum while she's dying, but I've got shopping to do, you know, and I've got to pick up the kids from school or whatever. So. You know, and then the question, you know, the, you know, what they felt, you know, my my mum and and my aunties felt that, you know, if it was them, you know, they would they would so much have loved it if someone had had, had given them a needle and and put them out of their misery, you know. I mean, that's what that's what they wanted, yeah. Uh, and uh, they felt it was cruel that uh, you know you couldn't uh, practice euthanasia. They felt it was terribly cruel, and there's a there's a good reason for that. It's not an unreasonable point of view. So that's one of the things we always have to come back down to is what is your motivation? You know? So if you're making the decision to kill, well, if you make uh, a decision to, in that case, say, say a case of euthanasia, just a case in point, you make a decision to kill, um, you know, what is your motivation? Is the motivation to relieve pain? Yeah? The motivation to relieve pain is a, is a wholesome motivation. So that's a wholesome, a wholesome place to come from. Or is it, as I said, is it to get hold of the cash or something like that? Is that why you're making the decision to kill? Or is it really just because you feel uncomfortable with it? It's perhaps a more more cogent one. Yeah, I don't actually. <laughs> it's it's unpleasant for me to see my granny dying or to see my dog dying or something like that. Yeah, I don't like it. it feels very uncomfortable. Yeah? Is it more convenient for me? So this is where it gets very dicey. Yeah? You have to sort of look at that motivation within yourself. And so if you make the decision, on the other hand, if you make the decision not to kill, right, then what's your motivation there? Is the motivation there out of respect for life? Yeah? And is, is it because you recognize that this being uh, loves their life yeah? and that you respect that process and don't consider it that you're right to interfere with that, right? Is that one? Is that a motivation you have, or do you not uh, do it simply because you're afraid of making a decision? Yeah, is it just because you think, oh well, maybe if, if I if I kill kill Granny, then I'm going to go to hell, yeah, <laughs> or something like that? I mean, it, it's kind of fair enough to to have that kind of consideration, but. That that's a different thing from actually thinking of what is the welfare of that person. Yeah? Then you're, you're you're afraid of the consequences for yourself. Yeah? So this is a different motivation. So it's very important in that kind of situation to consider and reflect back on what is my motivation, what am I actually trying to accomplish here. And the critical thing is that uh, is that there will never be a right answer. Yeah, and you just have to accept that, and you just have to deal with that. Yeah? And with, that's the reason why they are moral dilemmas. 
the ethical dilemmas because there is no one right answer. And the Buddha spoke about four kinds of kama, yeah? black kama, white kama, both black and white kama, and neither black nor white kama. Yeah? It leads to the end of kama. So that's the practice of the Eightfold Path, the realizing of Nibbana. Yeah? That's the only way <laughs> to solve all of these problems. Yeah? Realize Nibbana and then you can be finished with it all. Yeah? That's, uh, that's the only solution. Otherwise, you're in this realm of samsara and there's black things, there's white, there's, you know, black, there's black decisions, there's white decisions, there's, you know, straightforward cases of good and bad and we know what the right thing is to do. But there are many cases and all of these moral problematic cases where it's actually a mixture of black and white. It's very important to recognize that the Buddha, um, the Buddha actually recognized this and made this a central part of his teaching on karma, yeah? both black and white karma. So we can't ask, you know, is it right or is it wrong? Yeah? Yeah, what we can do is we can appreciate, well, look, there are positive sides, there are negative sides to this, yeah? And we try to make our judgment as best we can within that context, yeah? And to recognize that as long as we are clear about our motivations, we can't go too far astray, all right? Even though our, our decision might not be a perfect decision, we can't ever know that. But if our motivation is right and we're sure about our motivation, yeah, then we can't ever go too far astray. And even if it is mixed, and even if there is some black and some white there, there won't be there can't be too much black in there. Yeah? There might be a little bit, yeah? but there still can't be too much because our motivation is coming from the right place. So this is something and this is this, this, so this all comes back to, the, that, that appreciation comes back to, the, again, that idea of uh, post-conventional thinking about moral issues. Now, we can't expect our ancient scriptures to give us a black and a white answer to everything. And, you know, there was, the, you know, this is one of the you know, terrible things that we do to our uh, ancient scriptures. And we, we expect... That our, that our text or our, our traditions can answer all of our problems for us. Yeah? And so we impose on these, these scriptures these things which are going to you know, tell us how to live and answer every question of our life. And it's a terrible thing because it's not, those scriptures were not, never meant for that. They were meant in their time, in their context, to answer the questions that were relevant for them. And that's what they're addressing. Yeah? And if we can find guidance from that, that's terrific. And so, you know, there was, a, well, was one of the things they say, for example, about the uh, Old Testament. So some people say that, you know, they say that homosexuality is an abomination according to the Old Testament. Well, maybe that's the case. It's somewhat dubious, but it's also the case that, that seafood is an abomination according to the Old Testament, yeah? So <laughs> you can condemn the gays if you like, but you have to condemn prawn cocktails as well, yeah? <laughs> it's just as bad. And so you... We're completely selective about how you choose these things and what you want to make of them. So, you know, we have a simple moral precept, don't kill. And most of the time, that's good enough, yeah? 95% or 99% of the time, if we stick to that, we're going to be right, yeah? That's the conventional level, and we don't have to think about it too much. Yeah? But then there are those cases where that's not, that's not enough, and then we have to reflect on it, and we have to think, how is it going to be applied? And so this is where that post-conventional thinking has to come into play. And this is where we're reflecting on it on the basis of those universal principles of compassion, uh, of uh, understanding that you know, we are sentient beings, we share that in common. Yeah? Uh, the principle of the golden rule, do unto others. Yeah? And, so, and to really apply these things, and not, they're not just uh, abstract principles, but to really do that, you know, if you're in that situation, to really try to put yourself in the place of that person or that animal and f try to feel what they're feeling. Yeah? You can sit down and meditate with them. What, what are they going through right now? What are they feeling? Yeah? And what, what is the best for them? And so answer, asking these questions, the more and more we ask these questions, the more we can become sensitive to it. And then sometimes the answer will come to us. It'd be like an intuitive knowledge of what's, what's right and what's wrong to do in that case.
So that's a little talk this evening on, on uh, life and death and um, the golden rule and what to do when you've got a sick pet. So uh, I offer that for your reflection.